This island had great surf and great diving. I surfed there, dived there, lived with the local Creole fishermen, Simon and Danielle de Dune, in a place called Tamarin Bay. While I was diving uh, on the island, they taught me to night dive. So I looked around the water and started making out these jellyfish, box-shaped, finger-like tentacles. I thought, well, is that, a, is that a jellyfish? Yeah, it must be. So I reached out, and sure enough, it was a jelly. Okay, come, give him. Oh, and my right leg crumples underneath me, and I realise the poison is already numbed or paralysed the right hand side of my body. And this young kid carried me up across the sandy beach, which is really hard. Amen. Amen. Uh, man. Uh, yeah. Amen. Man, right, man. Man, amen. 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 I realize he's afraid for his brothers on the reef. I just lay down on the ground. And I started to feel very weak and tired. I feel my eyes beginning to shut, and as my eyes begin to close, I hear a voice speak to me. It says, son, if you close your eyes, you shall never awake again. I said, what? Who said that? As I looked to my right, I expected to see a man standing next to me, but there was no one there. That's bizarre. But I knew I'd heard a voice speak to me. Close your eyes, you'll never awake again. So that means you'll die. I see Danielle appear from nowhere, runs up to my side. To my amazement, an ambulance comes flying to the car park. Hurry, hurry, it's a jellyfish, please, hurry. As we race towards the hospital, I start to see on the inside of the ambulance what appears to be a small boy with white hair. I see sections of some kid's life with snow white hair. I then realize as I'm looking at it that this is me. This is sections of my own personal life. I thought, am I that close? With my mind, I did a mental check, you know what I mean? Of my own vital signs. My mind told me I am very close to death. As I'm lying there, I think, well, I, I could be that close to death. I may not make it. Well, I'm lying there having no idea what to do next, and I see appear before me a clear vision of my mother. She looked straight up into my eyes. She said these words. She said, Ian, no matter what you've done in your life, son, no matter how far from God you may be, if you'll but call out to God from your heart, God will hear you, and God will forgive you, son. I thought, well, if there is a God, which one? I'd seen thousands. I'd travelled through Kandy, Sri Lanka, been through Bora Batur. I'd been to so many different places. And I'm lying there, I thought, okay, God, if you're real, show yourself. I used to say, if unless I see God, I won't believe. Well, I lay there, I'm going, show yourself, and I'll pray. No face appeared. My mother kept saying, pray from your heart. God, if, you, if you're real, this is real. Help me to pray. Help me to pray the only prayer I've ever learnt. Help me to remember the Lord's Prayer. As I said that, words began to appear before my eyes. Forgive us our trespasses and sins. I thought, how on earth could God forgive me? I mean, it's too late. I've done too many things wrong. God. God, if you are real, and you can hear me, please forgive me. 
forgive me? those who have trespassed and sinned against you. Oh, that means forgive other people. I can do that. I'm not a vindictive person by nature. God, I can forgive anyone. No matter what people have done to me, I forgive those that have sinned against me. As I said that, the face of the Indian taxi driver appeared in front of me. I thought, what on earth is this man doing here? The voice said, will you forgive this man for pushing you out of his taxi tonight and leaving you for dead on the side of the road? I thought, no, you must be joking. Not forgiven him. I mean, I was furious with that guy. And the next minute, the Chinese guy's face appeared in front of me. I thought, what on earth is he doing here? And the voice said, will you forgive this man for not taking you in his car tonight and leaving you to die in the hotel? I thought, no. As I saw both of these men's faces, I thought, what on earth is going on? This isn't just some mumbo-jumbo prayer. I could actually be talking to someone who could be God. This voice is actually personalizing this prayer to me. to me. <sighs> Their faces instantly disappeared. The next words came, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I thought, Thy will? I've led my own will. So I said, God, I need to know your will, but if you can help me through this, I'll seek it out. I'll find it and I'll follow you. I'll honour you all the days of my life. As I said that, the entire Lord's Prayer appeared before me, and for the first time in my life, I had total revelation of what it meant. But I found it so difficult to keep my eyes open. I just couldn't seem to keep my eyes open. I remember shutting them, and sighing a sigh of relief, and thought, I'll have a break for a few moments, and then I'll try again. As I did that, I felt a sensation like a release. The battle to stay alive had finished. I suddenly found myself in a standing upright position, wide awake. I knew I was awake. The trouble was, it was pitch black. And my first thought was, why on earth those doctors can't turn the lights out in here? What kind of hospital is this? As I stood there, wondering how long I'd been asleep for and why the lights were out, I thought, well, don't freak out. Let your eyes accustomed to the dark. Maybe you've woken up too quick. So I kept looking thinking my pupils had dilated, no light, couldn't see a thing, it was pitch black, like a dark room. So well, well okay, there must be some light in here somewhere. So I turned around 360 degrees, checking out to see if there's some light, couldn't see a thing. As I went out to my right, I couldn't find the wall. I thought, that's weird, have they moved me? So I started moving back to the left, groping around looking for my bed, couldn't find it. I thought, great, you idiot, now you've lost your beard. How on earth did you do that? So as I'm groping around physically trying to find my beard, the next thought that comes into my mind is that it's so dark in here, you can't seem to see your hand in front of your face. So I brought my hand up to where my face should be, and it seemed to pass straight through, as if there was no physical form there. I thought, that's impossible. You can't miss your head. I went for my physical body, absolutely nothing. I thought, what the heck's going on? It's like I'm out of my physical form. It's like I'm transparent, yet I have the uh, sensation of being a total human being standing here. Ian, who I am, appears to be standing here. What's happened? And as I stood there, I began to sense something on the, out to my right looking at me, 
in front of me, I felt like invisible eyes or something or someone checking me out. The darkness had an evil presence, cold, encroaching evil pervading the atmosphere. Where, where am I? Shut up. stood there realizing I could actually be in hell. A radiant beam of light pierced through the darkness above me. As this light touched my face, I felt an awesome presence go through me and my entire body seemed to lift off the ground and be translated up into this light and radiance. As I've been drawn up into it, I can see that it's coming from a circular shape opening far above me. I feel like a speck of dust being drawn towards this light. As I'm being drawn up towards it, I thought, is this real? I look back over my shoulder and far beneath me, I could see the darkness. Still not understanding what this light was, I began to move up to the opening, enter it. As I was drawn into the opening, I could now see that it was a tunnel. As I looked along the length of it, I could see the, the source of the radiance. My first thought is the center of the universe. Look at the light. Look at the power coming from there. As I've been moved towards it, I watch as a wave of radiance comes up. As this wave of light comes off the source, it touches me and I feel warmth, comfort. All that kind of fear and darkness just seems to go out of me and I feel a living light go through me. Shafts of radiance came out from the central core. It was like a white fire. Phenomenal radiance in the central core. From that, I watched this brilliant light piercing out. I thought even the stars in the universe, even the constellations, must find their energy source from this focal point. What is that light? Is there someone in there, surrounded by this radiance? As I questioned that in my own mind, a voice spoke to me from the center of the light. The moment I hear his voice, I recognize it to be the same voice that spoke to me in the ambulance, telling me to the Lord's Prayer and whether I'd, whether I'd forgive. And he said, Ian, do you wish to return? If you wish to return, you must see in a new light. Words appeared in front of my eyes. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all i thought god is light could that possibly be god and in him there's no darkness at all i've just come from darkness whoever this being is he is completely separate from darkness i see no shadow i see no evil only pure white radiance and he knows my name could it possibly be god that i'm standing in the presence of talking to I thought if it is, he must be able to see my spirit absolutely naked. He must see everything. I began to pull back. As I began to pull back towards the darkness of the tunnel, I watched a wave of radiance come off him. I expected it to touch me and literally catapult me back into the pit. But as this wave of light emanated forth off him, it moved through me and all I got was love. The love was causing me to literally blubber. I was actually just bawling my eyes out. That I could feel an acceptance coming. I said, God, you can't love me. I've cursed you. More love. I said, oh, I've committed all kinds of sins. I've slipped around, I've taken drugs. More. As the love kept coming, I then literally divulged the, what I knew to be the most debauched things in my life. As the light began to open up, I became aware that, that standing in the center, I began to make out a man's bare feet. Around his ankles were dazzling white robes, garments. Not garments of cloth, but garments of light. As I looked out and saw that, 
I began to lift my face up to see the chest of the man and, and his arms are outstretched with dazzling white robes as if to welcome me. As I looked, I knew that I was looking upon God. S such... You're just awestruck. You, you can't be prepared. You have no way you can be prepared to see this. You just, I stood in absolute amazement. And as I looked towards his head, his hair was white radiance. I out of his face appeared to be light billowing forth, literally permeating out of like the, his entire face. You couldn't see the features of his face because the light was seven to ten times brighter than all the light I'd seen and it was literally um, uh, emanating forth from his face. I began walking closer towards him. I wonder if I could just see his face. I'll know who God is. As I got within a few feet of his presence, I began to place my face into the light. As my, and it didn't hurt your eyes. It was like you could look into it. As I placed my face closer in towards his face, hoping I'd break through that veil, as my face did, he suddenly moved. I saw an opening in a circular shape like a window into eternity or a door into eternity. As I looked through this, I could see an entire new earth open up before me. It was like I was standing on the threshold of eternity and I was getting a glimpse into it. As I'm looking, I can see grass with the same light and life emanating forth from it. I can see flowers, fields. I knew if I stepped on the grass, it would not damage it. The colour in the energy and the life emanating from it. I, it was amazing. I see a, ri a river or a crystal clear stream, trees along its banks, rolling hills to the left. I look out to my right, mountains in the distance, blue, blue sky, crystal clear. I'm standing there and I'm going, this is paradise. As I'm looking, I know that I belong here. It's like I knew I had been created by God to live here. I thought, why wasn't I born here in the first place? Why was I born on this earth? I knew I'd come home. I knew I'd travel the world looking for that paradise. And here it was in front of me. I thought, I'm home. I'm home. As I started to move in, his presence came right back in front of me and blocked the way. He asked me this question, he said, Ian, now that you've seen, do you wish to go in or do you wish to return? God, I'm not married. I've got no children. There's nothing for me to return back for. I don't want to go back. As I look back, to my amazement, God showed me one person that had loved me. The moment I saw my mother directly behind me, I wept. I thought, I've just not only lied to God, but there is someone who loved me. And I thought, if I'm dead, and this is actually happening, and then I step through into paradise, into the presence of God. Will my dear mother have any idea that her heathenistic son prayed in that ambulance, repented of his sins, gave his life over to God, and God heard this young man and caught him up into paradise? I thought my mother will think her son went to hell. I thought she'd get a, a telegram or a telex saying your son died last night. Would you like him shipped home in a box or a jar of ashes? I thought if that happens, it could destroy her. She's suffered so much, she's lost her family. And I thought, near I, her, how selfish would it be for me to step through and leave my mother to bury me and think I went to hell? I want to go back. In 1980, I was a rough and ready kind of a guy. I drank a lot and partied a lot, and I was moved to Tucson, Arizona, and I was working at a construction site. And uh, one of the guys brought some water from Mexico that was contaminated. And I ended up drinking it by accident. 
got real sick contracted cholera and within about 72 hours I was flat on my back and basically dehydrated. That's when I passed away. I noticed that when I passed on that of course I wear glasses and I'm very nearsighted. I noticed that, the first thing I noticed is that I wasn't wearing my glasses and I could see clearly across the room. And when I turned my head I noticed that my body wasn't moving. And I was lifted right out of my body and hovered over my body looking down at myself and looking around and next thing I knew I went through the ceiling of the, of the room I was in and I was in as transported into a very, very, very black, dark void. I could hear like somebody speaking to me like, like telepathy and it was explaining to me many, many things that I have, I no longer remember, but most of the, the idea was, was explaining to you the whys of life. Um, why there was evil in the world, why, why this, why, you know, people have questions all the time. These were being answered to you as you were being transported to this light. And time you got to, the, to where the light was, you were, you knew, you knew what happened, you know what's going on, you know, you know what happened, you know you died, you know you're going to be judged, and everything that's, as you're traveling, it's made so clear to you that what's happening is perfectly just and right. Oh yeah, I was going through the, the darkness and I was approaching the light there. And I noticed that on this rock, there was a big huge boulder right out in the middle of this darkness. And there was a person sitting on a throne. And the individual that was sitting on it um, was emanating light. Very, very powerful, bright light. And there was a love and compassion too, but also a firmness and fairness emanating from this person and I'm going, you know, who is this? And the basic question that was coming to me through this thought was, look what you have done with God's gift. That was actually Jesus was speak, speaking this to me. He said, if I let you into heaven with what you know now, that I'm just right, perfect, you would misuse that and keep sin alive in heaven. You can't come in. He told me it was granted to me to see a land unknown that's best forgotten, but will not be left unseen. That was it. And then he took out all these keys out of his robe, just pulled them out. And as he pulled them out, you could see the, the scar where the, the, the nails were kind of like in the wrist area and it kind of pulled the bones apart. It's kind of traumatic looking. And he had these keys and the keys were odd shapes and design. And he opened up a, he walked over to a place and he opened, stuck this key into this, looked like a, a gate. And a door opened. Then the veil came over and it was dark again. I couldn't see it, all I could see was the Lord. And I was being moved toward this door and I went through the, that door into a void. I mean, a, a tornado vortex. It was just going round and round. It was a tunnel spinning horrendously around. Just, roaring and roaring and spinning and spinning and spinning. And it smelled horrible. I could hear these screeches and noises and sirens. The most thing that I remember the most was slurping noises and, and um, screams and I could feel um, heat, really hot heat. Next thing you know, I was falling through the sky. You know, it looked like the sky, and I hit the ground. You know, it kind of hurt, and I stood up, and I, and I looked, and I go, where am I? All these people ran out, and some of them looked like people that were dead that I knew, and other people I knew that were not dead. And they come around me, slapping me on the back, and I said, they got there awful quick because the house looked far away, but all of a sudden they were there, slapping me on the back, welcoming me there, but something just wasn't quite right with them because they looked weird. They had yellow glints in their eye, and their eyes were almost uh, reptile-like. I looked over and I saw what looked like my best friend turn into somebody else. And I, and I said, hey, wait a minute, you can't do that. This is, this, you're not who you say you are. Who are you? 
And then all of a sudden I looked around and I go, all these things, that all these people around me are not people. They begin to morph into what they were. They were ugliest creatures I've ever seen. The pile like some of them, oh, they were just god awful, like rotting vegetables and they were distorted and twisted and then they were not perfect by no means. And they were just filthy, smelly creatures. And they were just starting to come at me like they're gonna shred me to pieces. And they start, one tried to grab me right across my chest, and one tried to grab my legs. And while they're trying to tear you to pieces, they backed away, and this one that looked like my best friend earlier, who morphed into different people, came up to me. It was a little, it was about 4'8, looked like a sort of half dinosaur, a reptilian type creature, and it was hissing and spitting at me. And and uh, I was speaking in a language that I couldn't, qu I didn't know what it was saying at first. I was telling, and it was broken in English, it was telling me to come follow it, follow it, follow it. So he motioned to me and we took a few steps and all of a sudden we were at the end of the horizon. That doesn't make any sense, but we came across to what looked like the end of the horizon. You couldn't go any further and I couldn't understand what it was. And yet I could look out and I could see all this vast fields and mountains. And, and then he stuck, that creature stuck its hand in this horizon and he ripped it open like a veil and he stepped out of it up on to this road and he telling me to come, motioning me to come. So I did the same. I just went ahead and I got up and the next thing I knew I was on a large, wide, dusty, flat road. I just came out of a cell, a cube. It was, either, it was around 10 by 10 foot square, it could have been 14 by 14, but that's what the dimensions were. And, and there was a cell next to it, next to it, and there was a cell above it, kind of set back, concave, so they're going up. And there were six of them to the roof of, the, uh, of, of, of this place. And in the walls are embedded people in cells. And he pointed to another cube, and in this cube, I was looking at, there were people inside these cubes. Some were vacant, some people some waiting for people to arrive like I did. There's this person in there, and I was just looking at them, and then it was showing me another person, another person. Each person that was in their cube was like they were reliving parts of their life all over again, but they, and not in a very pleasant way, it's like a living nightmare. And as we were walking along, um, I realized that hell is just an enormous big place and there's many other parts to hell that I did not see. I just saw this place called the pit. And so it says, it's been granted to thee, follow me out to the middle of the road. So we walked out in the middle of the road and all these demons and creatures running around and I you know, saw all these people in various stages of torment. And some of these demon creatures inside these cubes were going in at will and they would be attacking people in various ways. But to the people, they look like other people or times in their lives, or they look like demons. Whatever their worst nightmare was is basically what they were living. We walked along to another cube, looked inside of another individual that was there, and it reminded me of a, an old sailing ship. And um, this guy used to be a captain of the ship, and he was being flogged. Things that he did on this old sailing ship, but he did the, he did it for pleasure for these people because it was his ship, and he liked to be mean to his, his crew, and it was being met it back to him. I noticed this this being, this creature, looking at me. It was in in a cube at first, and the person who was looking at this particular into this creature is one of those tall creatures with the round, with the faces that went, went around, but it was of a beautiful purplish color, in a way, kind of a beautiful creature, but hideous at the same time. And with its faces revolving around, very seductive, very, very flattering, very, very persuasive. It would try to plant thoughts in your mind, trying to tell you, why would such a good God allow people to suffer like this? It was trying to get me to curse God. I really don't know who the demon creature was. I know he had great power and authority. He either was a second in command or he could have been Satan himself. This one vortex was spinning and a lady that had just died in a car wreck came through and she de was deposited right there. And I saw her as she arrived and inside her cube, 
she saw it as the illusion of her grandmother's farm, that her grandparents' farm that she loved so well as when she was growing up. And her grandmother recently passed away too, so she got in this, this cube and immediately she thought she was in heaven because there was a grandmother waiting there welcoming her. The grandmother that was actually a demon that gave the illusion of being the grandmother said, Dear Pudding, she made it to heaven. I'm so glad you're here. And she really thought that she was in paradise. But there was a darker side to her. She would make her children be what she want. Her children wanted something else. She wanted them to be this. And if they didn't do it her way, it was the fist. It was verbal abuse. It was cutting down. So, as she sat down, I was watching it, and the tree's limbs just grabbed her. And then she realized she was not in paradise. And as we passed some cubes, there were people inside, and they were trapped in flames. And it was like their skin was still intact, but they were burning. And there was this individual, and he was playing pool. And this guy was a child serial killer, but he lived in the 1940s. And he, but he was in this pool hall playing this pool before the punishments would commence again. He thought he had a break. And then these people in there would torment him and come and run and just grab him and tear him up. And out of the sky, I could see this um, big, big demon coming down. It reminds me of a snake. He just gobbled him and swallowed him. Then all these other little demons came up and said, you know, that's no fair. We didn't have our chance with him yet regurgitated him back up, he was whole. I know this sounds really bizarre, but that's what happened. Then all the other little demons, little teeny things, about a foot, three foot tall, just jumped on him, and he was powerless. And they were beating him and clawing him, and there was no rest for this guy whatsoever after that. It was constant torment. Everything that he ever done was, was being justly put back to him. Came to a cube, and I was looking at this, and this was a woman. She was dressed in fine garb, she was a temple prostitute, basically what it was, and she was somebody who died in Corneth around 69 AD. For a price, she would have a, a, a newborn son. For some reason, their religion was some strange thing. When you have a newborn son, you can offer it to, into a statue, and there's flames under the statue. You put the baby on the statue, and the, basically the baby would be cooked. And here she is in this temple, there was no let up to her torment. It was almost like all the little babies that she burned that were hers and other people's were tormenting her, mocking her, pouncing on her, just crawling and tearing her up. And she just screamed and I had to turn away and walk. There was a, an individual that um, she practiced the black dark craft. She was a witch. I just knew that she was a witch, but she died many, many, many hundreds of years ago. But she was trapped in a coffin, scratching, trying to get out. She couldn't get out. She was in, in that position for years and years and years and years, hundreds of years. And then finally, when she got it open, all the demons would pounce on her. And I walked on to another cube. We looked in this other cube on, the, on this row, and there was another lady. And she believed that Mother Earth could save her. And then if she honored the trees and the rocks, and she was into this nature thing, and part of their religious practice that she would practice would be getting out in the fields and dancing around a fire with a bunch of other people doing the same. The people that she thought that she was with were actually demons, and they would come up to her and say, you did this, they pick up a stone. You think the stone will save you here, and they smacked her with it. So she was standing there, and the demons reached down there and, and reached in her mouth, ripped out her tongue and part of her thing. Says, you talk bad? Oh, the stones are not going to save you. Nobody can save you. Then they ripped off her, just actually took her skin and just peeled it off. It was really slow and agonizing to shreds until nothing to the skeletons. Then they took the bones and broke the bones. And she felt everything. And then her body would come back together. The flesh would come back together, and she'd be whole again, and it would start all over again. A different scene would happen. And some of the cruelest people on earth were in these. And we were walking in another segment of, of hell near the back recesses of the wall, another segment of the deep, dark pit. 
And we're coming to this one pit that was, there was one place, and this, the cube was open, and inside there, this demon was trying to get me to go inside <laughs> this cube in what looked like a dentist chair. I'm not afraid of dentist at all, but this thing looked like a dentist chair to me, with all these hideous creatures in there trying to say, this is where you are going. And they want you in this cube here. And they were trying to get me in there. And I didn't want to go. And this part is very hard for me. Because you got to understand, you are so scared. And only, this whole time you're there, you're just saying, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. By that time, I was probably saying Jesus Christ so fast, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ so fast, that it was a blur. That's all I can say. They wanted me in this cube, and I was scared. I didn't want to go in this thing. And like I said, throughout the whole time, you felt a connection with somebody from above, the Lord. And then all of a sudden, you could feel something coming for you. I, I was so petrified, I couldn't distinguish what it was. You could feel the footsteps wa walking behind you and the ground thundering. And as it closer, whatever it was was walking behind me. And I was too scared to turn away to see who it was because I didn't want these things to rush me and grab me. And all of a sudden, they started coming toward me. And then the presence got right behind me, and they all scattered. And that purplish, big, tall, demonic creature, the regal creature, kind of backed slightly away and kind of bowed and kind of walked out, just kind of slithered on into the, into the mist, into the darkness of hell. And the Lord was carrying me up. And I knew who it was, it was Jesus. He picked me up. <laughs> this part I remember though so so clearly. He just picked me up in his arms and I could see the and they crucified him. As he's holding me, his his bones are pulled apart. He's saying I <laughs> he pulled apart my bones. And he carried me. And kind of floated through the air and went through the, the center of the bottomless pit. I went straight up. I remember bits and pieces of being taken to a hospital and waking up in a hospital room. And nurses poking me. And when I woke up out of this thing trying to breathe, I grabbed the doctor and said, I'm not in a cube, am I? <laughs> I better not be in a cube. And the doctor says, no, you're in a hospital. <laughs> and for me, I was no longer an atheist. <laughs> there was a God, there is a heaven, and there is a hell.